Adventures in the Peace Park. When we first got to Glacier Park, six days and nights after leaving Utah, having circled through Wyoming for five long days, familiarity and close quarters had long since begun to take their toll. A bit on the ragged side, our enthusiasm for touring was having a hard time keeping up with the landscapes. Put up your window. It's cold back here. Deal with it, pussy. I don't want to deal with it. Put up the fucking window. We were all distracted, no doubt, by how the trip would soon change. For Ernest, it was his plane to catch in San Francisco. For Abe, probably just the trip's second beginning after getting rid of Ernie. And for me, as my wise brother might say, it was really a combination of a mixture of things. So what color was the wolf, ma'am? The ranger at the visitor center asked. Did you get a good look? He added, maintaining a frown of genuine concern. Real grayish, said the woman in front of us at the counter. It was gray, maybe with a little brown and white on its side. Well, now, if, if it had been all gray, with a spiffy blue collar, then I could assure you it was one of the wolves that we've been keeping track of, said the ranger. However, Ernie turned and raised an eyebrow and grinned an imposing regal grin. Hear that? Wolves they haven't kept track of. He rubbed his hands together three or four strokes. Sure you guys can handle this? He turned slowly back to the counter. We paid no attention to him and looked, at, looked to the ranger as the woman stepped to the side slightly, looking a little puzzled. Thanks for reporting it, though, ma'am. We'll certainly keep our eyes open. Hi, fellas. What can I do you for? We want to do some hiking, Ernie answered. Of course you do, said the ranger quickly. The ranger was a silver-haired guy with arms bigger than Ernie's. Ernie bench presses twice his own body weight, sleeps over a curling bar, and travels with dumbbells, like the perpetual high school wrestler, as if life was actually just a string of high school varsity tryouts. Jennifer complained about it. She said she tripped over the curling bar all the time, but she wasn't strong enough to move it, and the room, of course, was too cluttered to roll the thing. She even wrote a great poem about all this, once upon a time, one of her best, I always believed, from the renowned My Days with Stupid collection. The ranger asked the lady if there was anything more he could do for her, and, and then escorted us over to the relief map diorama, next to the pamphlet rack and the young bald eagle that someone shot before his head had grown white thrown in jail and levied a fine of fifteen hundred dollars, the plaque read. How much time do we have, men? The ranger asked. How much time do you need? Ernie asked him back. No, no, Captain. I meant how long do you plan to be in the park? Oh, day and a half, I guess. But we have to get to San Fran by, uh, the ranger cut him off. Okay, these over here are the glamour spots, boys, he said with an authorita authoritative double tap of his schoolhouse pointer. And over here are the grizzlies. Another double tap. For a bunch of men like yourselves, there's this hike over here. Triple tap. Up off the loop. You have to go up through some pretty serious terrain. Right up through Grizzly City. But up on top, up here, big single tap, is the garden wall. The ranger paused to look at us, maybe to gauge the brand of customers he was dealing with. From up here, tap, men, you can see the entire world. He indicated that in the entire world with a tight flourish of the baton, as though conducting a quick line from a familiar symphony. If you want to see the entire world, it'll take the whole two days, maybe more. 
quite a hike. Uh, what's this spot over here? Abe leaned in and asked the, asked the ranger, reaching across the map to the Many Glaciers Hotel area. Marked on the list of sites by ample parking, the hotel, and access to a handful of shorter trails. This way to Iceberg Lake. This way to Ptarmigan Tunnel. Oh, sure then, the ranger began again, looking a little disappointed, but, but not surprised. Plenty of good day hikes up there, and the drive is lovely, on the going to the sun road, up over the divide. And it might even look familiar to you fellows. They film a lot of car advertisements up there, he said with an emphasis on the vertice. He finished with a strong sticking tap pressed against Avalanche Lake. Just up the road here, a swell warm-up. So Ernie drove us a little farther up the road and parked the truck. We put our boots on, Abe and I, and quietly. Ernie had his on already. For the first time all trip, I laced mine up tight. An extra shirt for the colder air, a bit of stretching, and then up the path that turned out to be wheelchair accessible for half the first easy mile through the woods. A wooden walkway. The warm-up. That ranger was a prick, said Ernie, a hundred feet into the woods. Looking at the treetops, Abe smiled. He was? I'm serious, fuckwad. Everyone knows you're serious, Ernest. At the top of the trail near the base of Avalanche Lake, where, where it funnels into the icy stream that leads along the footpath, Abe stepped off the beach and walked onto the log jam. The lake was an unbelievable blue-green a color probably, probably only found in glacial lakes up north in late June under an absolute sun. Electric and the most colorful from a distance, and from up close, probably the clearest water ever known. Ten waterfalls strike the rock walls, dropping through slanted cracks and chutes from top to bottom, each probably hundreds of feet or thousands. There was no way of telling how high they were. Now, now what's he doing? Ernie turned and said, a little peaked, a little peaked. What? I hope the ferry falls in, freezes his ass off. This place is unbelievable, I said before noticing Abe again, out on the out on the lake. What the hell is he doing? I don't know. I looked. I squinted to see Abe more clearly, halfway across the jam. And then something tiny caught my eye, scooting along the dry log tops. A chipmunk, standing still all of a sudden on one of the fatter tree trunks. Abe moved close to it and, and just stood there for a few minutes, never taking his eyes off it. The two of us, Ernie and I, sat down on the bank and hooped our arms around our knees. Abe was talking to someone, or something. He stepped up to the log next to the one the chipmunk was on and stopped. The chipmunk turned 180 degrees to the left and then 180 degrees to the right. Abe bent down as if maybe to tie a shoe and snuck a picture of the guy, holding his cardboard camera down around his ankles. And the picture came out perfectly. Chipmunk perfectly square to the camera, up against the lake, up against the glacier. Then Abe stepped carefully back to the clearing at the edge of the trail. Let's head down, he said, quietly and discreetly, stepping up to the trail almost as if he'd just been sitting there next to us. You see what I'm saying? said Ernie. What? The guy's a freak. He's truly a freak. Let's go. We've got another drive in front of us. He's a freak, say it. Say, my friend Abe is a freak. I laughed weakly for a half second, but made an effort to keep it under my breath. I cleared my throat. Ha, I knew it. Come on, let's go. You're right, let's get out of here. Fifty miles and eighty minutes later, we reached our sixteenth or seventeenth campsite. We drove along the winding edge of the world, up through a tunnel, 
and over the Continental Divide at Logan Pass, where Ernie got his gruff picture taken with a billy goat, eating grass and shedding in clumps above the hairpin turn. At the St. Mary's Intersection Outpost on the east edge of the park, we stopped into a supermarket and bought ready-to-eat barbecue chicken and a six-dollar gallon of Gallo wine. Outside, Abe told his girlfriend Annabelle he loved her for 25 minutes on the phone while Ernie and I waited after filling the tank. In camp that night, we met a guy who was, as he confidently told us, almost 15. When Patrick first introduced himself, he said he was the son of a firefighter. Soon, though, he told us that sometimes he gets bored and throws rocks at the Mexicans on the San Diego freeway. His eyes were down, hidden. He was utterly serious, just swapping a story for a story. Hey, you guys, you guys like black jokes? He asked next, hesitantly, as though he had a couple of hustlers that he knew he couldn't show to, to just anybody. Well, little dude, A began, his voice a little less soothing than normal. A few of our best friends are African Americans, and so on. Ernie spoke up and said something like he thinks the funniest kinds of jokes are the ones you tell about yourself or the people you're related to. The kid turned away from Abe and stared, it seemed, halfway across the fire in the direction of Ernie. He then said sharply that he thinks his best friends are probably the ones he rags on the most. He asked why shouldn't he tell a good black joke just because he has black friends. No one answered him, but Abe looked at Patrick directly as if to verify he had yet another interpersonal dilemma on his hands. The kid dropped his head again to inspect the narrow trench he'd been digging with his thumbs. Take it easy there, Abraham. Ernie whispered from his sitting bag, and Patrick didn't seem to hear him. Go to bed, Ernie, Abe said, flustered. His brow knitted in a bunch. Ernie pulled the flap over his chest and zipped himself in. As I walked through the trees to the bathrooms to wash up, Abe's quiet voice glided along the path behind me. Then it was silent until I reached the buzzing door light of the facilities, moth wings fluttering in a loud but muted chorus. The screen door flew open when I pulled on it and then bounced back and slammed when I got inside. Back at the fire, Abe was lying on his back and smoking a fresh joint I didn't remember him having. Patrick was across from him, staring at Abraham and Abraham's hand, round-shouldered and red-eyed, looking pretty comfortable stretched out and saying nothing. I've been telling Patrick about the meaning of life, Abe explained. Don't listen to him, Patrick, I told the kid. Abe's a crazy man. Then I went to sleep. In the morning, the sound of popping joints and loud yawns sat me up in the tent. I watched Ernest for a minute as he blinked a few times and scratched an awkward itch in his pants, which he apparently slept in. He put his left hand on his gut, winced a little, looked forward at nothing, moved to the truck, grabbed his narrow roll of toilet paper and towel, and headed off to the trees. I pulled on a sweatshirt and left the tent. Oh, hey, dude, said Patrick, startling me, still in the dirt by the fire, the fire still lit. Hey, you know what time it is? Patrick asked me next probably around seven or eight or so, I said. Oh, shit. Patrick jumped to his feet and was gone through the trees.